Welcome. Today is the 15th day of Av, a special day in, on the Jewish calendar. Um, it is in a number of different things. The most important thing was always that this was the day on which the tribes uh, were allowed to marry one another. This happened in two stages. Uh, the first stage was after they came into the land of Israel after they had finished settling and dividing the land, then it became permissible to, for people from different tribes to marry uh, between themselves. And this was on this date, the 15th day of Av. And later on, about 300 years later, there was a war against Benjamin. And it was almost that that tribe was uh, taken out of the Jewish people. And thankfully, at the end, uh, there was a... There was a uh, there was peace made, and the tribe was reinstated into uh, into the uh, Jewish people. And so once again, there was this uh, this state in which uh, people were allowed to marry the Benjaminites. This is also the day that in Israel you actually feel this because today is the hottest day we've had so far in the summer, which is not so hot this year. Um, I don't think we're even at eight. We're probably ninety-one degrees right now, Fahrenheit, something like that. And this is considered to be the day on which the strength of the sun diminishes, begins to diminish, meaning that we're, uh, from here on out, the sun is weaker and weaker, leading up to the uh, fall, the months of the fall, in about uh, two months, and uh, after that, the winter. So this is also the day on which, later on, the sages used to say that on this day, you should begin to study Torah at night, meaning that uh, until now the nights have been sh very short, so it was very difficult to get any learning done because uh, by the time you went to sleep, it was like 9.30, and at 5 o'clock there's already sunlight, so people uh, weren't too keen on staying up. But now as the nights get longer and longer, so a person should add to his time for learning during the night from this day and on. Okay, and we're also the 19th of August, and we're going to be looking at the second reading of Parshat Ekev. And here we're going to focus on chapter 8, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 11 and 14. I'm going to read them by skipping. These are verses that almost are identical to verses we saw last week, in last week's Parsha. They're just a little bit different. It says like this, Take care lest you forget Havaya your God, lest your heart grow haughty and you forget Havaya your God. So I skipped here uh, between a few uh, verses. And even though this is like a, this is called Musar. It's like Musar is like when I rebuke someone or I tell them something, you know, you should be behaving this way or behaving that way. This is not exactly a mitzvah, but according to one of the uh, enumerators of the 613 mitzvot, this is actually a mitzvah. And the mitzvah here is that your heart should not grow haughty. Haughty means prideful. And the, the sage who says this is Rabbi Moshe of Kusi, uh, a city in France, and he wrote what's known as Sefer Mitzvot Gadol, the, it's almost like the great book of jokes, so there's a great book of, of commandments. There, the reason is because there's a small book of commandments that was written a little bit earlier, the Smak, this one's called the Smag. Um, it, it, it's not how many commandments are in it, but how long the discussion is. And he was a very special and interesting uh, person. He was a great sage. When you read his uh, material, you see the depth of his thought is just uh, phenomenal. Um, he's also one of the Tosafot, meaning that he's one of the uh, descendants of Rashi, and they uh, spent uh, their lives elucidating the Talmud further after Rashi. So we're talking about the 13th century. He also, one of, the, uh, one of the commentaries that we have from the Tosafot, it's called Tosafot Yeshanim, Old Tosafot, on, on the Tractate of Yoma, is from him. Again, he's a very great sage, but what makes him special is that he really was 
in touch with his dream world. And he followed his dreams. He had different dreams. One of them was to write the Sefer Mitzvot Gadol. One of them was to write this book, this great book of mitzvot, or this larger book of, uh, of mitzvot, of commandments, and to enumerate the 613 commandments the way that he saw it. In principle, he follows Maimonides, and he holds Maimonides in great esteem, but he also deviates in a number of places. And one of the places where he deviates is particularly regarding this mitzvah, the mitzvah not to let your heart grow haughty, which, if you think about it a little bit, is the basis of all character development. It's the basis of all Jewish ethics, is that the person not be prideful. And interestingly enough, as we'll see, I hope that we get a chance to uh, read it, um, he at first didn't include this as a commandment, as one of the 613 commandments. He left it out. But then after he finished the book, he had a dream, and in his dream he was told that he left out the most important mitzvah, and that the most important commandment is that you should not let your heart grow haughty. Let's read it inside. Uh, with Rav Ginsburg's commentary as he was teaching it um, at a wedding some time ago. And he writes like this, um, Beware that you do not forget the uh, Havaya your God is a warning that the children of Israel should not become prideful. And this addresses the community as a whole, not just as individuals, not just individuals. So, Really, he's saying that this was talking to people in general. It wasn't specifically on someone. When the Holy Blessed One bestows goodness upon them, upon the people, then the danger of pride arises when there is a material prosperity, as is the case today with certain material well-being. There is a risk of becoming prideful, of one's heart becoming lifted and forgetting Hashem. The Lubavitcher Rebbe desires, as does the Torah, that we all be wealthy. But it is dangerous, as it is well known that the spiritual test of wealth is more difficult than the test of poverty. And the main challenge is for the person who has wealth, lest you forget saying, what does the person say, like we saw in last week's Parsha? My power, my prowess, the might of my hand have provided me with this wealth. So you are blessed to become wealthy, to be able to fund all your activities, and also to participate in the activities yourself and at the same time you need to observe this commandment not to become prideful and again this is the essence the starting point the major teaching of what Jewish ethics are about not to have a prideful heart and say that their prosperity and hard work for which they invested much effort earned them all this says Rabbi Moshe of Kusi and they do not attribute any of it to Hashem because pride is the opposite of acknowledging one's dependence and gratitude to God. Because of their arrogance, for this the verse warns, the core of the prohibition is here in our parsha, but the narrative begins in parsha of Etchanan, and already said, and houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and you shall eat and be satisfied, beware lest you forget. And this is the interpretation that I explained explicitly earlier, says Rab Moshe of Kusi. And from here is a warning that a person should not become prideful about the Creator, about what the Creator has granted him, whether in wealth, beauty, or wisdom. Now this is very interesting that he mentions beauty also. It's not something you would typically think that somebody of this stature would mention. It reminds us, again, that he lived his life based on dreams. Um, he wrote the book based on a dream. He added this mitzvah at the end based on a dream. And this reminds us of Joseph. Joseph was the dreamer and the dream interpreter. And Joseph was also very beautiful. That's one of the things that the Torah tells us about him. He was so beautiful that he, his, some of his downfall was because of his beauty. So he says, you shouldn't be prideful of your wealth, your beauty, or your wisdom. Rather, one should be very humble and lowly of spirit before Hashem and before people and give thanks to his Creator who granted him this advantage. And the Song of Ethics, it's interesting that this is what he calls the Song of Azinu. He says that when Moses, just before he parts the world, he tells us the Song of Azinu and the second to last Parsha, in Parsha Azinu. And it's a, it's a Song of Ethics. 
So in the Song of Ethics, what does Moses say? He said, O foolish and unwise people, is he not your father who acquired you, who made you and established you? And the scripture praises humility as it is stated the man Moses was very humble. And it is said in the Jerusalem Talmud, what wisdom made as a crown for its head? What does this mean? What wisdom made as, a, made as a crown? So wisdom, let's say you are wise. Where will your awe of God be? It'll be like a crown above your head. But humility made the awe of God a heel to its soul. Remember we talked about the heel yesterday about percussion instruments. Here what he's saying is, if you have humility, awe of God is simple, it's easy. If you have wisdom, it's a crowning achievement to come to awe of God. Think about this. The wise person finds it very difficult to be humble before God. The person who's humble, sorry, the wise person finds it difficult to be in awe of God, even though wisdom is considered to be the key to feeling awe of God. But the person who's humble, for him it's like stepping on something. It's something that's below him even to have awe of God. This means that the awe of God is both the beginning and crown of wisdom. And similarly, humility made the awe of God the heal for its soul. Therefore, we see that humility is higher than all. It is written, the beginning of wisdom is the awe of God. And it is also written, the heal, meaning the reward, like we saw yesterday, of humility is the awe of God. And it is the way of the Shekhinah to rest upon the humble, as it is stated, I dwell with the contrite and lowly in spirit. And it is taught in the tractate Sota, in the Talmud, that anyone who humbles himself is considered by Scripture as if he offered all the sacrifices. It's a very important thing to know. As it is stated, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. This is from Psalms 51.19. What does this mean? It means that we today can't bring any sacrifices. So for us, the all-encompassing sacrifice is to sacrifice our pride. And when you sacrifice your pride, it's as if you brought all the sacrifices that a person needs to bring in the temple. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. So now, this he says, he taught in general to the places where he went. One thing that we need to mention is that he was a traveling preacher. Um, He didn't start out that way. He started out in France as a scholar. But then he had a dream. And in his dream, he saw that it was placed upon him to cause the Jewish people to prepare for the redemption. And to do this, uh, they have to repent. They have to do tshuva. And he was told that the most important place to do this was in Spain. So he left for Spain. And wherever he went, he preached his teachings. He preached about his book, the book that he was told in a dream to write about the 613 commandments. So he was preaching about this idea of humility and he was addressing it per, in, in, as a general thing. He never spoke to people personally about them. But now he says, After all of this, I have also preached that even to the desires of their hearts, the Holy Blessed One hears the desires and fulfills their wishes of the humble. Even though they did not pray for them, as it is stated, the desire of the humble you have heard, O O God, you prepare their heart, you incline your ear. In other words, he's saying that when a person is humble, he doesn't even have to speak out. He doesn't have to say anything. God hears his needs from the inside. And why is this? So a simple explanation would be because it says that a person who has pride, he, God says about him, I and you, 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 you who have pride and I, cannot dwell in the same space. So it's like when a person has pride, that supposedly he's like pushing God out of his space. But when a person is humble, he and God share the same space. Because of that, God's already inside of him. He already knows everything that he needs, everything that he thinks of. And so the humble are taken care of uh, uh, even before they speak. So there's a lot more here. Um, I refer you, God willing, today hopefully to the wonders that should be up later today. And uh, there we have the whole, the whole uh, uh, quote, the long, uh, the long citation from, uh, from this book with all of Rav Ginsburg's, Rav Ginsburg's commentary, which I skipped over because uh, I saw that it wasn't working so well. 
Uh, you couldn't tell the difference between what he's saying and what Rav Ginsburg is saying. So with this, uh, we'll end today. Thanks for joining. I hope to see you tomorrow. And I'm sure that we'll all be much, much humbler <laughs> with more humility tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good morning, Rabbi.